So it will it will go to live even if it's after the time. Okay. Oh, all right. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I have the mic here. Um, is it? You want to test it? Which test? Which mic? The LAV, you know, just the... Yeah, you, you are, I, I see, if you're using that, I, I'm joking up, right? Oh, okay. Yeah, I see it. Yeah, 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 we have the... Okay. I'll give it to him and uh, I'll tell him we'll start. I mean, you, you tell me when, uh, when it's ready and I'll tell him. الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على رسوله الكريم ومن استنى بسنته إلى يوم الدين رب شرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل لقدة من لساني يفقه قولي اللهم ثبتنا عند الموت بلا إله إلا الله آمين يا رب العالمين Welcome back to our Friday night halaqa or study circle study session and every week in uh, the month we come up with one of the topics that is related to a particular series and today we continue our fiqh of worship series okay so first of all um, we try to understand what is fiqh okay I, I want to repeat this concept of fiqh the difference between sharia and fiqh because a lot of people they get confused about these terms so what's the difference between the term sharia and fiqh what do you think? Those who are, we have some people attending here and we have people online also. So those online, you can uh, uh, write your comments in the chat section and we encourage you to come and join us here physically in the masjid so that we can make these sessions more interesting and interactive. Okay, so what's the difference between Sharia and Fiqh? Any ideas? Okay. So you're saying so one is theory and the other is the the application of it? Yeah. 
No, okay. All right. Any other idea? I just know that Sharia is law. I'm not sure about Sharia and law. law. It's stuff I like the studying and going to the subject deeper okay. and investigate the subject. Okay. Like yeah. They have like like looking into the subject. Looking into the so making more right. more struggle. Yeah. So the basic difference between the two is that Sharia are those laws that are directly mentioned in the Quran and the Sunnah. Okay. So if there is a law which appears in the Quran, for example, Allah forbids alcohol, that is Sharia. The mother gets one sixth when the son dies or the child dies. That's Sharia. Okay. And the Prophet wasallam said that you start your prayer by saying Allahu Akbar. That is Sharia. Okay. So those laws and those um, commandments which are directly mentioned. In the Quran or the Prophet's statements, they are called Sharia. Fiqh are those laws which are derived from the Quran and the Sunnah. They are not directly there, but a scholar sits in their time, in their circumstance, in their culture, and analyzes the Islamic laws, analyzes Quran and the Sunnah, and then extracts a new law based on the previous information. So he's not basically coming up with something new in religion. He's not changing the religion, but he's using the existing texts to derive a new law for a new situation, which did not exist in the time of the Prophet ﷺ. For example, today we use technology to give khutbah. Right now we're using technology, computers, you know, cameras to uh, convey a message. So when the technology first appeared, the scholar said, is this okay? Can we use it? Can we not use it? They said it was not there in the time of the Prophet. So there is no specific law in the Quran or Sunnah regarding technology. But then they said because this does not contradict or change anything as far as the information is concerned. It's just a means of conveying that information. In the Prophet's time there might be letters that they used to write. Okay. In our time, we have technology to reach out. So based on something which was there, they were able to extract a new law. And said, it's okay. Um, alcohol is forbidden. We know that, right? That's Sharia. But smoking, is it forbidden? Is it allowed? That's not there in, in the Quran or the Sunnah. The Prophet never talked about smoking. The, the Quran never talks about smoking. So, that's fiqh. Now the scholars have to sit and say, you know, let's analyze this new thing called smoking, cigarettes, and see if this is going to be okay or not. So that's fiqh. So that's the difference between sharia and fiqh. Sharia is fixed, cannot be changed. Fiqh can change with time, with place, with understanding, with new circumstances. So that's number one. The other thing is fiqh can be updated. Sharia cannot be updated. Sharia is timeless. Okay? So the same issue of smoking, for example, back in the 30s and 40s and 50s, when the cigarette smoking started spreading in the Muslim world, the scholars of the time, they reached an opinion. They said, smoking cigarettes is not haram, is not forbidden. It's makru, disliked. Disliked is a lower category, right? It's not like outright forbidden. It's close to forbidden, but there is some room there, right? So they said it's disliked. What was their reasoning? Why did they say it's disliked? They said because when some, someone smokes, the smell, the bad smell in the mouth and the air, it's not a good smell, right? So it should be, it's, it's disliked, but it's, it's not forbidden. It's not going to like, you know, be haram. You're not going to be sinful for smoking, right? But then in the 70s and 80s, when medical research started showing that smoking causes cancers, health issues. Now the new fatwa from the 90s onwards from Islamic scholars is smoking is forbidden. Why? Because Allah says in the Quran, وَلَا تَقْتُلُوا أَنفُسَكُمْ Do not kill yourself. Anything that's going to harm your health is going to be forbidden of course. So then they updated the fatwa. See the old fatwa on smoking is it's makru because of the smell issue. But the new fatwas now which are coming out based on the research, is that smoking is forbidden. A Muslim should not be involved in smoking because it is injurious to health and causes so many problems. 
So this is fiqh. Fiqh can update. New information comes, the scholars sit again, say, review, let's review this information again and see if we were right or we were wrong in the past. Or maybe it was applicable back then, it, it's not applicable now, it's a new situation, new culture, it is seen in a different way. Another example give you. In Islam, in Sharia, there is a basic principle that a man and a woman are different. They should not try to imitate each other. A man should not like try to you know, act like a woman, copy a woman's tone, language, dress code, you know. Should not try to appear like a woman. Allah created this as a man, should behave like a man. Similarly, a woman, Allah created a woman, should not try to, you know, imitate men in trying to dress like men or be like men. Both genders should be proud of what Allah gave them. You know, it's from Allah. We are, we say, Alhamdulillah, I am a man. Alhamdulillah, I am a woman. We don't have superiority or inferiority complexes, right? We are equal from that perspective. So that's the basic principle. We should not try to appear like one another. So from that perspective, if I have a skirt, if I come to the masjid with a skirt, it would be a problem. As a man, I should not wear a dress which is for women, right? But in Yemen and in Scotland, the men in those cultures wear skirts, right? That's a man's dress. It's not particular to a woman. So the scholars who are living in those countries, they say, if you're living in Yemen or Scotland, it's okay for a man to wear a skirt. But if you're living in another country where the skirt is primarily used by women, then it's not right for the man to wear it because then you are imitating the women. So you see how fiqh can change even according to the country, the culture, the circumstances of the time. So that's the basic difference between sharia and fiqh. Okay? This particular series that we have is fiqh of worship. How do we make ibadah? How do we worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? And thus far we have talked about the fiqh of water. What kind of water is permissible to use for purification? What are the rules of using that water? We have talked about najasa, which is impurities of different kinds. We've talked about tahara in general, pur purification. Then we went to wudu. We've talked about wudu in the past. What is the correct way of making wudu? What breaks the wudu? And you know, some of the issues related to wudu. And we are now in a subject which is related to wudu. And that is the wiping over the sock when you make wudu. Okay, so that's where we are. I wanted to bring you to the context as to where we are. If you've missed the previous sessions, they're all on YouTube. If you go back to our YouTube channel, uh, Islamic Center of East Lansing, you'll find all the previous sessions are there. So let's get into today's talk and that is wiping over the hoof and the sock. By the way, what is the hoof? Hoofain? What is the hoof? The leather sock. In the Prophet's time in Arabia, they used to use a special sock which was made out of leather. And people would walk in it, would travel in it. It was easy to put on, put off. And it was, was for protection. I mean, the, the hot, hot earth, you know, if you're traveling through Mecca, Medina, the desert area, it was very, very hot. A regular sock would, would not be enough at times. They needed very thick kind of boots or thick kind of socks in order to uh, protect them from these weather conditions. So that's what the hoof is or the hoofain as they say. And then we have the regular socks which are made out of wool and cotton and so on. Sometimes it might be that one has hoofs or a turban or bandages or socks etc. for purposes of protection or it may be that they are difficult to remove. In such cases one may simply wipe, wipe over them. So this is the general rule here. The general principle is if you are making wudu and you have something which is covering the parts of the body where you should make wudu. Let's say my hand, I have to wash my hand, my face, my head, you know, any part of the body which is required for washing in wudu. And you have a covering over it. It could be a turban. In some cultures, they wear those turbans. Again, in the Prophet's time, they used to wear the turban. Uh, or it could be socks, leather socks, regular socks. Or it could be somebody who's injured and they have a plaster on, bandage on, whatever, then instead of washing that part, what is allowed is just wetting your hands and wiping over that area with wet hands. Okay, So this is the general rule, but we're going to talk about it in more detail. It is reported in Mutawatir Ahadith 
that the Prophet ﷺ wiped over the khuf and enjoined doing the same. So what do we mean by mutawatir hadith? Hadith we all know. What is the hadith? A, a statement, a saying of the Prophet ﷺ, a tradition of the Prophet ﷺ, right? But what is a mutawatir hadith? Have you ever heard this term before, mutawatir? Okay, so that is a continuous chain which goes back to the Prophet ﷺ. Let's say I am Imam al-Bukhari, 200 years after Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and I am trying to collect his hadith. So I go to Brother Khalifa. Brother Khalifa says, you know, I know Brandon, and Brandon knows Muhammad, Muhammad knows Khalid, and you know, and Khalid met Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. MashaAllah, he is the one. <laughs> so I'm giving an example of the chain, right? Because I, I am living 200 years later, right? And I'm trying to find out what did the Prophet say. But I have these people who go back from grandfather or from teachers, scholars, or they have written books or they have recorded the hadith. And so I track down those people. Okay, that's why Imam Bukhari, Imam Muslim, these guys who were writing hadith books, it was a very difficult job. They had to travel hundreds of miles, thousands of miles on foot, on camel, on donkey, whatever was it, just to track one hadith down. And today we have thousands of hadiths available online in our books, but we don't value them as much. But these people really valued that knowledge, right? So, a mutawatir hadith is a hadith which is not only complete, it, it has a complete chain, going back to the Prophet ﷺ, but it has multiple chains, multiple independence. So, this is one chain, right? I go through you guys, Brother Khalid, to the Prophet, peace. Then there is another chain. I find another brother and another four or five generations and they also go back to the Prophet and I find a third chain and a fourth chain and a fifth chain. And all of those chains are saying the same exact wording of the Prophet. The Prophet, peace be upon him, said so and so. What does that mean to a Hadith scholar? The one who is collecting? This Hadith is really strong Hadith. Why? Because how can all of these different people lie, right? The idea is, if somebody is making it up or lying about the Prophet, he would make one mis you would say something, he would say something else, the third chain would say something else, a fourth chain. But if all these independent chains are saying the exact same thing, then that must be true. So that hadith is the highest level of authentic hadith called mutawatir. What is Quran? Quran is mutawatir. From hundreds of chains, it came down to us. So it's mutawatir. That's the highest, the, the most perfect uh, transmission. Okay. What's the one next to it? So mutawatir is the best. Multiple chains, authentic chain. What's the one lower than it? It's not as authentic, but it's still pretty good. It is a chain which is complete, but it doesn't have multiple. Maybe one, only one route to the Prophet, peace be upon him. Or maybe a second route, one or two or three. Then there is a difference of opinion. Some scholars say in order to reach Mutawatir, you need four independent chains. Some say you need ten independent chains. Then they only consider it Mutawatir. Anything less, less than that, they say it is Sahih. So that's the second. Sahih is less than Mutawatir, right? That's why we call these books Sahih Bukhari, Sahih Muslim, because they have authentic narration. So that's number two. What's the one lower than Sahih? So we got Mutawatir, the most authentic, then we got Sahih, and what's the one? Hasan. Hasan. Yes, very good, mashallah. Hasan. Okay, what does Hasan mean? Hasan means agreeable, good. Meaning that there is some issues with the chain, but those issues are not major issues. The majority of the hadith scholars say it's still good. This hadith is still good, we can accept it. Okay, so for example, the Prophet, peace be upon him, said, whoever dies on Friday will have no questioning in the grave, is exempted from questioning in the grave. This hadith is a Hassan hadith. It's not the highest authentic level, it's not the second, but it's in the middle. Most scholars say it's good, it's okay, it's fine to believe in this hadith as authentic hadith, right? You can use it as evidence still. So up to Hassan, we are good. We can use a hadith up to Hassan. Now below the Hassan level, we get into problem area. Now we get into the problem hadiths, right? Narrations. What's the next one after Hassan? Daif. Daif. Daif meaning weak. Weak. Meaning the chain has a problem somewhere. 
the chain which I am using to get to the Prophet peace be upon him has somebody who is unknown. An unknown person, I have no information about this person, was he truthful, was he a good Muslim, did he come for Salah, you know, did he lie, did he have a criminal history, right? Da'if we don't. From, from, from Da'if downwards, we, you know, you, it's better not to take it. Now some scholars would say if you have a lot of Da'if hadiths and they're all saying the same thing, then some scholars might take it. Some scholars say if it is not in the area of aqidah, beliefs, if it is not in the area of halal and haram, right and wrong, if it is about virtues. For example, a hadith of the Prophet might say, if you pray these two rakahs, you will get great rewards in Jannah. See, this doesn't change the religion, right? If you pray two rakahs extra after Maghrib prayer, you go to Jannah, right? This is a hadith, but it is not authentic. But if there's a lot of these narrations, weak narrations coming from different parts of the Muslim world, some scholars, not all, some scholars might take this and say, because this does not change the religion, it's just about virtues of different deeds, it's okay, it's all right. But to be on the safe side, what is the best thing to do? Stay away from these weak narrations, right? Yeah. So how come now modern scholars, they say, like al came in the 20th century, mm -hmm. So the modern scholars of our time who have re-evaluated the classical works, they have not done anything which is new. What they have done is use the same information which has come from other scholars of Hadith like Bukhari, like Muslim, like Tirmidhi. Mm -hmm. yeah. Meaning that Imam, Al -Al for example, Sheikh Al-Albani who has evaluated this, he has used the same criteria as the previous one, but he might have agreed with one hadith scholar over another from the past. And he says, I think it is da'if. Okay? So it's not like he's making anything new. He's just agreeing with somebody who already said it was da'if, as opposed to someone who said it was Hassan or Sahih or whatever. Okay? Anyway, so that's number four, da'if, weak. And then the last one is the worst, <laughs> maudu. Maudu, complete lie, fabricated. You know, so I tell you something the Prophet said, and I give you a chain, and those people in the chain don't even exist. <laughs> I never met those people, and I'm lying to you and saying, I met Brother Khalifa, and Brother Khalifa, uh, you know, lives in a part of the, the world where I've never even traveled. And I'm claiming I met Brother Khalifa. So the scholars say, how come this scholar is claiming he met this scholar, and he never even visited that part of the world? So that means he's lying or, you know, he's a problem. in the, So when there's major problems in a chain of transmission, that is called maudu. One time I did some research on this. I found out that there are close to 60,000 narrations in the Muslim world. 60,000 hadiths which are floating around. And the number is much more. There's into hundreds of thousands, but repeated. Most of them are repeated. But 60,000 main narrations. Out of these 60,000, you'll find close to 40,000 are either weak or fabricated. So that leaves only 20 to 30,000 really good pure narration. And it is these fabricated traditions which cause the problems. You know, innovations in religion. We start new practices in religion based on this hadith or that hadith. Uh, we start uh, dividing ourselves, disunity. You know, I am right and you are wrong because I have this hadith and the Prophet said this. Or, I mean, subhanAllah, one time, um, in Pakistan, when I was a kid and used to go for Juma, there were these, this guy was distributing a booklet on Hadith. And at that time, I had no knowledge or understanding of these. I'm just a young guy trying to follow religion or understand religion. And this booklet was full of Hadith about hatred towards different groups. The Prophet said, you know, if you meet such and such group, group and you, you know, hate them or you injure them or you kill them or you, <laughs> then you will go to Jannah or something. And I'm like, I'm surprised the Prophet said all these things. And then later on, I found in the Prophet's time, those groups didn't even exist. <laughs> I mean, those groups came hundreds of years later. And these guys have invented those hadith in order to put down each other. To show we are right. My masjid is good. My imam is good. And your imam is the worst imam out there. So, you know, you have to be very careful with the hadith of the Prophet, peace be upon him. Because there's people who abuse it. So, going back to the subject. So what category of hadith are those hadith which show that wiping over the sock is the practice of the Prophet ﷺ? Mutawatir. The most authentic ahadith are coming for this subject.
meaning there is no doubt that this is authentic. Now, this is not just Sahih Hadith or not just Hassan Hadith, Mutawatir Hadith. Multiple independent chains prove that the Prophet ﷺ did this. Right? Also, Al Hassan, he said, I was told by 70 companions of Allah's Messenger that he used to wipe over his hoofs. So it's very, very clear. Imam Al Hassan, the grandson of the Prophet, ﷺ, he said, I met 70 companions who told me that the Prophet, peace be upon him, used to wipe over his socks, his hoofs, right? So that shows it's very, very clear. Also, Imam al nawawi one of the scholars, early scholars, he said, the permissibility of wiping over the hoofs was reported by innumerable companions. There is no doubt that the companions did this. There is no doubt that the Prophet ﷺ did this. Also, Imam Ahmad, he said, there is not a shadow of doubt in my mind concerning the legality of wiping over the hoofs as there are 40 hadiths of the Prophet, peace be upon him, indicating its perm permissibility. And these all, all these scholars are from different schools of thought. Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal from the Hanbali school of thought, Imam al-Nawawi from the Shafi'i school of thought. And you'll find from different uh, schools of thought, all of them have agreed that it is absolutely uh, from the Prophet, peace be upon him, that you can wipe over the hoof or the saw. Uh, Abdullah ibn al-Mubarak, one of the early great scholars, has also reported similarly. So these are, you know, all beautiful uh, scholars and great names of the past in the early centuries. And truly, I wish I could have sessions on each and every one of them, their lives. Because of their works, when you study their biographies and what they achieved and what they did, it's amazing you know, how much hard work they did in short life. Like Imam al nawawi this first one here, he died at the age of 41. And when they counted his work, they found out on an average he was writing 11 pages every day. 11 pages every day of his life in the short. You know, now, I, I am a student. I am you know, a student in the master's degree. They give you an assignment for the semester to write like a couple of papers for 2,500 word, 3,000 word paper. And it takes you the whole semester to find the research and the, the you know. Subhan, and it's a pain. So when is this? When, when am I going to be done with the word count, right? And this guy is writing 11 pages every day of his life, scholarly work, which, you know, today we are using, subhanAllah. So each and every one of these were beautiful scholars, mashallah. Wiping over the hoofs is better than washing the feet as it is taking the rukhsa, the ease from Allah, following the sunnah and differing from the people of innovation. Another question might come to uh, some people's mind. Yes, it's allowed, but should I do that or should I wash my feet? Which one is better? Right? Because traditionally we wash our feet when we make wudu. So should I wash my feet every time or should I wipe my over my socks every day? Which one is better? Why is wiping better? For these three reasons. What are the three reasons? Number one, it is taking the rukhsa. Rukhsa, the ease. If Allah gives you an ease and you don't take it, then what, is, what are you actually doing? Resisting. You're resisting. You're making the religion harder on you. Allah is saying, I, I want to make it easy on you. And you're saying, no, I want to make it harder on myself. Right? So that's, that doesn't not give you more reward. What gives you more reward is taking the rukhsa. I mean, and this is the ummah of the Prophet ﷺ. The Prophet, peace be upon him, said, whenever I'm giving, given two paths, legal paths, one is easy and one is difficult, I'll take the easy one. You don't make your life unnecessary. That's why Islam is beautiful. It, it makes your life easy. It's not unnecessary hardship. Do you remember in the story of Prophet Yusuf ﷺ in the Quran, Yusuf ﷺ, when he's in the prison, Prophet Joseph, he's in the prison. Because, you know, of the women who have accused him and the town has accused him. And then that man comes to him, the one whose dream the prophet had interpreted. A man comes to him, you know, and says, the king has seen a dream. Can you interpret that dream for me? You know? Yusuf alayhi salam, and he says, I'm going to get you out. But what does Yusuf alayhi salam say to him? Before, before you get me, me out, I want you to settle my case with the women. Okay, right? That's the condition. Yusuf Ali says, I'm going to come out of prison, but first you settle my case with those women, right, who accused me. Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, is reported to have said, had I been there instead of Yusuf Ali Salam, I would have taken the easy option. Come out of the prison. <laughs> come out of the prison, we'll take care of that issue also later. So, subhanAllah, this is the religion of Islam, and this ummah is to take the easy 
option whenever there's two options you take the easy one that is legal option <laughs> i'm not talking about one is bad option easy one and the other is good option hard one no both are good options and one is easy one is hard because i don't want you to go back and say imam sohail told me you know it's okay to take the easy options and <laughs> you know <laughs> yeah because that has happened with me also in the past um what's the second reason it's better to wipe because you're following the sunnah the way of the prophet you're reviving a sunnah and this is something which the prophet used to do and now you're reviving it in the current times in your life so the, there is more reward in wiping over the sock because you're reviving a forgotten sunnah right even when we are at home wherever sure. even if you're at home yes and we're going to talk about those law you know rules of when and where but yes even if you're at home and the third thing that it is uh, makes it better is that it makes you different from the people of innovations when you stick to the sunnah then you're avoiding innovations in religion because every time an innovation comes in the religion what does it replace a sunnah okay because the prophet told you do do it like this and you say no 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 i will invent my own way of doing this right so what you have done is you have replaced what the prophet said with what you want to do or a cultural norm or a practice yes brother we'll get to all the rules we're getting there yeah how to do it and you know all of that will so these are three reasons why it is better to do the wiping than to the to do the washing every time of the foot because you're reviving the sunnah you're different from people of innovation and you're taking the ruksa wiping over the shoes and boots also takes the same ruling as long as they cover the entire foot some scholars like ibn taymiyah do not even put these stipulations and conditions so that was about the hoof right the sock yeah. what about the boot can you just wipe over your boot also the majority of scholars say yes you can do it as long as the boot goes above your ankle covers the entire foot not like the shoes we wear you know or the slippers where half of the foot is showing and the other half is covered no as long as the boot goes above the ankle then you can do the wiping over it as well okay just like the sock the same thing for the sock not those sports socks you know which go hardly cover the ankle the sock has to go above the ankle according to majority but my, there is a minority group of scholars like ibn taymiyah who say you don't it doesn't even have to cover the whole foot you can do it on any anything which which you are wearing uh, as a foot covering yes brother khalifa so that's not like so you'll be walking everywhere yes and even in your home you'll like if you go to the kitchen you wash your hands and yeah the bottom was the food now when you wipe my understanding is you wipe and i know you got to tell us yes yes but the bottom mhm this is the bottom to be clean Mm -hmm. yeah, you know the boot, you could wipe over the boot this way, okay? Yes. But how about the bottom of the boot? Yeah. It can, you know, if you're walking all over the place with it, yes. it can be clean. Yeah, so when we say clean, and we, we discussed this issue when we were talking about Tahara and Najasa, the Islamic definition of what is clean and pure is not the same as our definition. The Prophet ﷺ, when they used to make Salah in the Masjid, was there a carpet in the Masjid in the Prophet's time? There's no carpet, no carpet. So, and was there a proper roof? No roof. So right now it's raining. Right now, in the Prophet's time, when it would rain, what would happen? The water would come into the masjid, and there would be a mud pool in the masjid, and the Prophet and the Sahaba would make salah in it. Now, is that dirty or clean? You're making salah, and all the mud is sticking. <laughs> See, that's what I'm saying. So, dirt is not. the same as najasa is not impure dirt is not impure. we actually make tayammum with dirt when there is no water we use the dirt to make the so that is not najasa that is najasa for the carpets that's a modern problem why why don't we bring our shoes into the masjid and pray with our shoes on is it forbidden in islam to bring your shoes in the masjid and pray? the prophet and his sahaba all the time had shoes in the masjid and they were praying in their shoes because there's no carpets in their time the reason we don't bring shoes in the masjid is because of the carpet how are you going to keep the carpets clean so it's it's not a problem at all that you uh, pray in your shoes or that there is dirt on your shoes as long as there is no urine as long as there is no stool as long as there is no alcohol you know those are the kinds of impure things which should not touch your body or your boots or whatever 
Otherwise, you can pray in your shoes, you know, outside, like in the grass when you pray. Keep your shoes on and pray. Actually, when I go outside, I, I try to keep my shoes on so that people will learn. Because nowadays, people have this wrong understanding that you have to remove your shoes in order to pray. Because we're so used to praying on carpets, which makes sense on a carpet. There's an interesting story in uh, Medina University, you know, in, in Saudi Arabia. There was this uh, alim, this scholar, salam alaikum wa and he was giving a lecture on this, this issue of praying with your shoes on. And the prophet used to pray with his shoes on. And it's allowed, you know, it's not a problem. So a group of these young students, young Muslim students, they learned for the first time in their life that it is sunnah, that you can pray with your shoes on. So they said, okay, we're going to do this and we're going to go to Masjid al-Nabawi with our shoes on. Masjid al-Nabawi, the prophet's masjid in Medina. And the scholar said, no, 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 don't do that. Because number one, the carpets are there now. In the Prophet's time, there was no carpet. Number two, people don't know this and you're going to start a fitna. People are going to get angry at you when you go in the masjid with shoes on. And they, they don't understand. They don't have the knowledge. The common person doesn't. They said, no, no, no. They were you know, full of zeal. We want to revive the sunnah. <laughs> right? So they go like five, six, seven brothers go in Masjid al-Nabawi with their shoes on on the carpet, carpeted area. And the front row is full of all these brothers from, you know, Pakistan, India, you know, these brothers who are, mashallah, very good worshippers, but, you know, they don't have much knowledge about Islam, you know, the details of Islam. So they saw these guys come in, you know, with their shoes on, and they started beating them. <laughs> there was a big fight in Masjid al nabawi in the front row, because these guys brought their shoes on. So the scholar said, See, I told you, told you, don't do, you have to have some wisdom also in the way you revive the sunnah, right? Now we have carpets. It makes sense not to bring your shoes on the carpets because how are we going to keep them clean? But from the perspective of Islam, there's absolutely no problem if you have dirt on your shoes, mud on your shoes. As long as it's pure dirt and mud, there is no najasa involved in it. You can pray in it. There's no, no issues at all. And Allahu alam bi sawab. Okay. So, did we understand this issue? The boots can also be, you can wipe over the boots as well. The majority opinion is what? That it should cover the entire foot up to the ankle. Okay. The minority opinion is it doesn't need to. Okay. So, by the way, where do they get? Why? Are, why is there a difference between these two opinions? Why are the majority saying it has to cover the ankle? Minority saying there is no need for it. What's their reasoning? Why are they? Okay, so so the, the minority, you're saying minority said that because it's impractical? Yeah, so that it's a different understanding of the shoes. Yeah, yeah so... Because the, because the shoes used to cover most of the Yeah, so what, what they're trying to do is they're trying to uh, do the fourth tool in uh, fiqh. So we have Quran, Sunnah, and we have Ijma, which is the consensus of scholars. And we have a fourth tool that is called Qiyas. Qiyas is comparison, where you compare something new today with something which was there in the Prophet's time and you try to make the same ruling. Okay, I, earlier I was talking about alcohol is forbidden, right? Are drugs forbidden in Islam? Drug abuse? But there is no, no Quranic verse about it or no, no specific hadith. Then how did the scholars arrive at the conclusion drug abuse is haram? Harmful to the body just like alcohol. Yeah. See, that's qiyas. You're using a new thing and you're saying it has the same effect like something which is mentioned in the Quran. Why did Allah uh, uh, forbid alcohol? What does it do to your mind? Takes away your mind, right? So anything which will take away your mind will also be having the same ruling. So this is what, what you call qiyas, where you take a new thing, you compare it with something which is there in the Quran and the Sunnah and you give it the same ruling. So these, the majority scholars, why do they say that the, the, the sock has to cover the ankle? Because they say in the Prophet's time, the hoof that they used to wear, used to cover the ankle. It was not below the ankle. So anything you are going to replace it with now in our time, like a sock, also has to cover the ankle. They said the hoof was thick. You could walk in it for you know long distance and it will not like tear up, right? Water could not enter the hoof. It was waterproof, leather, you know, the water will stay out. So they say the same ruling has to be for the, the sock. The sock has to be thick. You can walk on it in the road and it will not tear up. And it has to be thick enough so that the water does not enter it. 
That's the majority. But the min minority, like Ibn Taymiyyah, what's their reasoning? They're saying, no, no, none of this is required. Mm -hmm. Most people wear different shoes, I guess. Okay, so, so one reasoning could be that, you know, to make it easy for different kinds of people who don't wear it, right? So that, but their, their basic reasoning was, they said, you, you, there's no basis for Qiyas here. Why are you making the comparison? What's, what's, your, uh, what's your proof that you have to have the same exact thing as the Khuf? The majority are saying it has to be exactly like the Khuf in the time of the Prophet, right? The minority are saying there is, there, you, don't have, you don't have to make that comparison. Anything that covers the foot will have the same ruling. Whether it is full covering, half covering, little covering, thick coverings, you know, whether water goes in it, doesn't go in it. Where are you getting this from? There is no proof for it. You're just making a comparison. So you see, this is where the difference is. The majority say we have to make a comparison with the Prophet's time and how the sock was in that time. The minority are saying we don't have to make that comparison because there's no uh, proof for making that comparison. So this is where the difference of opinions come from. But to be on the safe side, what, what would I recommend? Minority. Yeah, no, to, minority. minority? <laughs> you like the minority opinion. Huh? <laughs> Once again, it's up to you guys, whichever scholars uh, that you want to follow. But the safer side is that, you know, it should cover the foot and it should be, you know, somewhat thick. It should not be a completely thin uh, sock. Now, we go to the question that you were asking earlier, the home, right? For a resident, this wiping is good for 24 hours. So what do you do? Let's, let's go through the process so that we understand how this wiping works. You make your full wudu. Okay, you wash your feet. Make the full wudu. Then you put on your socks. So when you put on your socks, you are in wudu. You have to be in wudu when you put on the sock. If you're not in wudu and you put on the sock, it will not work. Okay, you have to be com in complete wudu and then you put on the sock. Now, for from that point up to 24 hours. Even if you go to sleep. Doesn't matter. You break your wudu, right? When you go to sleep, your wudu is gone. So, next time you will make wudu, what will you do when it comes to turn for the feet? Just wipe. Up to 24 hours, you can do that. For a resident, somebody who is living in the, the town, you know, in their hometown, whatever. For the traveler, they can do it for three days. This is the ease from Allah. If you're traveling, then it's hard for you. Then you can extend this wiping over the sock for three days. You don't have to every time wash your feet. You have the sock on and you just wipe it whenever you break your wudu for up to three days. So this is the, the basic ruling. Where do we get this from? We get this from the hadith reported by Imam Muslim and also from Aisha radiallahu anha when she was asked about this duration. So she said for the resident, 24 hours, one day, and for the traveler, three days, okay? Now we go to the conditions for wiping over the hoofs or the socks. Number one, as I said, to be in wudu before putting them on. You have to make complete wudu and then put them on. When a companion tried to help the Prophet wasallam in removing his hoofs, he wasallam said, leave them as I had put them after performing wudu. So the Prophet is, you know, making wudu and one of the companions comes to him and tries to take off his sock to help him out. The Prophet said, no, no, leave them on because I put them on after I made wudu, meaning I'll just wipe over them. I don't have to take them off and then wash my entire foot again. Also, Safwan ibn Asal, he said, we are commanded by the Prophet wasallam to wipe over the hoofs if we put them on while being in a state of ritual purity. So do we understand this first point? That you have to be in wudu before you put the sock. You have to be in wudu. Okay? That's the main point. Otherwise, it won't work. All right. What's the second condition? The hoof must be lawfully acquired, gotten, and made. Meaning it should not be made from a haram material, a silk, you know, if you're wearing, because for men, we are not allowed to wear silk. Okay? If it has silk, you know, it's, it's pure silk and you're wearing it, then it won't be uh, valid. Example of invalid socks or hoofs would be socks made out of silk for men or socks that somebody stole. <laughs> you know, and then they, are, then they are practicing the sunnah over the stolen socks, right? So that would not work out because, you know, they have to be legally acquired and made. The third one, the hoof or the sock must completely cover the foot up to the ankle. As I said, this is the majority opinion. 
They must be thick enough. If they are thin or do not cover the entire foot till the ankles, then wiping over them is impermissible according to the majority of the scholars. This opinion is based on ijtihad. Some scholars say wiping is permissible even if socks are thin and have holes in them and do not completely cover the foot since there is no proof, direct proof from the sunnah. So there's a difference of opinion among scholars. Once again, the safer opinion is that of the majority and Allahu Alam, Allah knows best. Any sock that is made out of wool or other halal materials that covers the entire foot is permissible for wiping over. It is reported that the Prophet ﷺ wiped over his socks, regular socks and shoes while performing wudu one time. So now sometimes people say you are only allowed to do this on the hoof, but not these other socks, right? This is one opinion that you hear. But the reality is we have an authentic narration from the Prophet peace be upon him where he wiped over his shoe and also his sock, not the hoof. In the Prophet's time also they had these kinds of socks which they would wear under. You know, they would put these on, then they would put the hoof on, you know, and then if the boot is required, they would put. So the Prophet did it on his socks one time. And you know, this narration is authentic, narrated by Imam Ahmad, Abu Dawood and At-Tirmidhi, which shows that it is permissible for us to use the same thing for our socks. Once again, you know, there's difference. Some say that these socks should not be very thin, should be thick, you know, should cover the whole foot. Those are where there's difference of opinion amongst the scholars. Okay, let's uh, talk about some other issues. According to a group of scholars, it is permissible to wipe over them even if one takes them off and then puts them on again for wudu. This is also a difference of opinion. Some scholars say once you put them on, then you have to keep them on for 24 hours. It cannot be that you went to sleep and you took them off. Now your wudu is broken and then you just put them back on and wiped over them. No, they said you have to keep them on for 24 hours and then you can wipe over them uh, whenever you break the wudu. Other scholars say no, you don't have to. There's no proof for it from the Prophet. You can take them off, put them back on, wipe over them because the Prophet said 24 hours. The Prophet did not say you, you have to keep them on. There's no, no hadith regarding that. So once again, there's difference of opinion in this issue. Once again, the best thing, the safer thing is to keep them on uh, as much as you can. Another thing that you can wipe over is the turban. You know, in some cultures, as I said, they wear turban in the Prophet's time. They used to wear the turban in the, in the desert. The turban and its like may be wiped over as long as it covers the area of the head traditionally covered. As long as, you know, it covers the, the head area where you wipe over. Okay, so if, if the whole thing is... So, yeah, so once again, the wiping over it, yeah, that's what once again, it will come back to the same difference. Some scholars will say it's okay, because there is no hadith uh, where the Prophet, you know, mandated that it has to cover the entire head. Others will say, no, we will compare it to the Prophet's turban. In the Prophet's time, how was the turban? It was covering the entire head. So that means whatever you're wearing has to cover your entire head for you to do this. Okay. So there, there will be a difference here. Uh, but you can, in principle, you can wipe over the turban or something similar to it. It is reported in many ahadith that the Prophet ﷺ wiped over his turban in wudu. Omar radiallahu anhu said, he who is not purified by wiping over the turban, then may Allah not purify him. <laughs> Omar ibn Khattab, he was angry because somebody told him, this doesn't work. You wipe over the turban, that's not valid. Omar ibn Khattab, he said, the one who is not purified with this, may Allah never purify him. Meaning, what are you talking about? Of course, this is good. Of course, you can wipe over the turban, right? So he was angry at the person who uh, brought that issue up in front of him. The wiping over the hoof and the turban is allowed only under minor impurity, not major impurity. So this is another thing we need to be careful. This is for wudu only, when you need wudu, not for the, you know, the sexual impurity. Uh, then you have to take a shower and all of that stuff, you know, is required. So this is only talking about issue of minor impurity. It is permissible also to wipe over splints, bandages, plasters, etc., some scholars are of the opinion that such areas should be left alone and no wiping is necessary over them as there is no direct proof for it. So once again, the same thing comes in. Some scholars will say, if you have, let's say, a plaster on there and you have to make wudu, they say, just leave it. 
you don't have to do anything with it because you have rukhsa from Allah. You know, it's, it's covered and you know, it's, it's an injury or whatever. So just do the other parts of the body. Other scholars say, no, you just take some, you know, water in your hand, wet your hand and just wipe over that area in order to make your wudu. This is the majority opinion. But it is allowed for this person to wipe instead of washing because when they obviously cannot put water in there and that can cause damage to the wound or whatever. If these coverings cover more that uh, more that than the part of the body needed for covering, the extra part must be removed before wudu. But those scholars who say that you need to wipe, they say it should not be more than required. Let's say you have a wound here this size <laughs> and you have covered the entire arm with plaster. Now you cannot just wipe over this. It should, it's only allowed for that area. So the rest of the plaster has to be removed or you have to find a way to get water in the other parts where, where the wound is not there. These kinds of wipings are even permissible at times necessary for major impurity. So this kind of wiping is allowed even in major impurity because the person is injured. Okay? So you know obviously they cannot take a shower if they have head injury or other injuries. Then they can just wipe over those areas and that is permissible and that is fine and Allah knows best. Any questions so far? We've talked about the khufs, we've talked about regular socks, we've talked about the different opinions, the different opinions on those issues, we've talked about the turban, and now we've talked about the bandages, the splints, the plasters, and all of these. Which shows what? What does it show? The flexibility of Islam, the ease of Islam. Islam is not an impractical religion which is going to make you do things that are difficult for you, or which are going to make life difficult for you. The same thing. It's not like a wound, yeah, the same thing. If, if it's, there has to be a reason for a cast, right? You know, there is a broken arm or whatever. The same ruling would apply. They can wipe over the cast. Okay, now we come to a little bit of a controversial issue. The sisters, hijab. So we talked about the turban. We talked about the socks and everything. The sisters might say, well, what about us? You know? Whenever we have to make wudu, we have to take the hijab off and then, you know, do the wiping. Is it allowed for us that we can just wipe over the hijab? Because the hijab covers the head and it is like the turban. So, should we be allowed or not? What do you guys think? Yes, I think yes. Yeah. Yes, yes, you think it's the same? It's a, any other differing opinions? <laughs> huh? You think it's the same? Not the same? Allah knows best. <laughs> I would say definitely yes. Why not? I mean, you know, like, I would say yes. Okay. No, I'm just asking. I'm just asking. I'm not <laughs> accusing. <laughs> you know, like, if it's allowed for us. Yeah, if it's allowed for the men, then, then why not for the women? You, I mean, that's a valid, that's one of the opinions. That's one of the scholarly arguments. Okay. So we have three opinions. You have something, brother? Okay, depends on what the wives of the Prophet ﷺ did. That's a, that's a good argument. We should look at the Prophet's wives, right? Because they become the examples for this. So we have three opinions. So this is where scholars have you know, issues. It's not as simple as for the men wiping the socks or the, the turban or whatever. Okay. Number one, not permissible. Majority. Majority of scholars say it's not permissible. This includes Imam Malik and Imam Abu Hanifa. Hanafi school of thought, Maliki school of thought, they don't allow it. What's their reasoning? They say, what's the evidence? Where is your evidence? We have no reports from the Prophet's wives wiping over their hijab. We have no reports from, you know, the, the, uh, the female companions of the Prophet ﷺ wiping over their hijab. So they say, you have no proof. And can you do something? Can you invent rituals or allow things or disallow things without proof? They say, no, you cannot do that. So this is the majority opinion. They said women are not allowed to wipe over their hijab. They have to take the hijab off and do the wiping uh, properly under it. So that's the majority opinion, the Maliki, the Hanafi school of thought. Number two, permissible. Shafi school of thought and Ahmadi school, Hanbali school of thought. Imam uh, Ahmad ibn Hanbal and Imam Shafi, they say it's allowed. What is their proof? They say it's like the men. Qiyas. Qiyas, yeah. They said, you know, what's the difference? Why, why we have to 
why we have to need separate proof for the women? If the men, the prophet did it for him, himself and it's the same head, is there a difference between the head of a man and a woman? They say, no. He says, both are human beings, both need to be ritually purified, both are trying to make wudu. So if the men are allowed to do it, then why not the women? So this is their reasoning, permissible. A third group, which is another minority, like Ibn Taymiyyah, they say permissible only if head covering is difficult to remove and causes unnecessary hardship. They say it's okay, but if it's easy for the woman to remove her hijab, then she should every time remove it and then do it. But if it's hard, you know, in some cases it can be hard for a woman, maybe she's outside in a public area and then she has to remove it or find a, a private area to go there. And, you know, some hijabs are very tight, you know, with a, a sister's head might be big and it's, you know, a, there's different, different fashions, different cultures, you know, the head coverings could be different. If it's hard for the woman to remove it, then she can wipe over. But if it's easy for her, then she has to remove it. This is the third opinion. So these are three opinions. Now, my humble opinion, <laughs> my humble opinion is that it seems to me that there is no difference between a man and a woman in this regards. In fact, a woman is more in need, in my opinion, of this concession than the men because she's wearing the hijab and the difficulty for her is more in removing it every time she loses her wudu. Thus, it is permissible and Allah knows best. So, this is my opinion. You don't have to go by my opinion. Uh, this is based on the ijtihad, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So, three opinions are there. I wanted to bring all three opinions, uh, but then, you know, this is what I favor, and Allah knows best, you know. Any comments on that? <laughs> so, you guys already agreed with the, the second opinion before I even uh, introduced it. Huh? You like the second opinion more, and I'm sure a lot of sisters like it too. Right? <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we'll become all Shafi'is and Hanbalis <laughs> for at least for this uh, this uh, issue, right? <laughs> it it differs, brother. It differs. If you if you kind of study these four schools of thought, you'll find that in some areas, um, Maliki is stricter than Hanbali, or Hanbali is softer than uh, than uh, Shafi'i. It's not like you cannot generalize it and say you know one school is strict in everything. No. And we have a series, uh, one of the series that we go over is called Evolution of Islamic Law, which is going to be next week. Next Friday, we're going to go over that. And that's where we explore these different schools of thought and where we are, inshallah, going to explore why they differ. What's the reason that, you know, Imam Ahmad might say something and Imam Shafi might say something else? What's the reasoning, the basis for their decision making and how their schools developed? Okay, so please join us next Friday for those sessions as well that they are beneficial. Okay, now we come to the way. How do you wipe over the sock? What is the way of the Prophet ﷺ and the Sahaba regarding it? With the hoofs or the socks, only the upper part should be white. With the turban, most of it should be white. With the splints or bandages and plasters, they should be wiped completely. Okay, so first of all, with the hoof, only the top part. So what you do, is you take, wet your hands with water and then you spread your fingers like this and you go on top of the foot starting from the toes towards the ankle part, just the top part one time and you're done. Not the bottom. No, not the bottom, just the top part of the hoof or the sock on either side with your left and right hand and you are done. This is the way the prophet did it, this is the way the companions did it. You, you, it doesn't matter. You can do it one at a time. It's uh, usually, you know, the sunnah is to go the right, to do the right side first. But, you know, if, even if you do both of them together, it's not a problem. And Allah, Allah, Allah knows best. Wiping over the socks is done by passing wet fingers from one's toes towards one's legs. Right hand for the right foot and left hand for the left foot. One should open one's fingers while wiping. Ali radiallahu anhu, he said, if the religion was based on logic and opinion alone, the bottom of the sock would take preference in being wiped to the top of the sock. See? Which part gets dirty? The top or the bottom? The bottom, right? So it makes more sense to wipe the bottom. But Ali radiallahu anhu is saying, I saw the messenger of Allah wipe the, the top. So he's saying it's not all about logic and, you know, reasoning and, yeah. 
It's symbolic. And it's, it's giving the Prophet ﷺ that position of obedience. We will do what the Prophet did because he's representing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's message on it. Just like Umar ibn Khattab when he was making Hajj and it was time to kiss the black stone. He kissed the black stone and he then started talking to the black stone. And he said, oh black stone, the only reason I'm kissing you is because I saw the messenger of Allah do it. Otherwise, you're just a stone to me. Meaning, you, you're not, it's not like superstitious belief. So if I kiss the black stone, then something will happen. No, there's no super. Allah is the one in charge of everything. But the reason I kiss the black stone is to follow the way of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Yes, Brother Khalifa, you have a... Of course, I was looking, I was emphasizing on the bottom. The bottom, yeah. Yeah, yeah. No, that, that, yeah, as I said, makes sense. Why does the teacher make it shahad? What is that? How does that fit? I, I, I mean, that's not there in the sunnah. I've not read anything to that effect. You know, people add their own du'as. And I mean, and I don't feel there is anything wrong if somebody's making dhikr while making wudu or as long as they don't feel like this is required for the wudu and stuff. You know, you can make dhikr, you can make dua, that's fine. But um, the point is that religion is not based on logic all the time. Yes, the vast majority of our deen makes sense. There is reasons, there is wisdoms behind everything, but not everything. I mean, why do we go counterclockwise when we go around the Kaaba? Why not clockwise? Because this is the way the prophets did it. Uh, why do we pray five times a day and not four times a day or six times a day? Because you know, not everything you can find a, a reason and specific logic and say this is the reason why we... No, we do it because Allah told us to do it like that. Because the messenger of Allah showed us the way and we follow that way. We have a question, brother? Uh, I just want to say, when people ask a question, if you can repeat it. Oh, or, you know, turn it or... sure, sure. Jazakum so khair. Thank you so much. And my phone is on if there's any questions online. Okay. So this is, um, this is today's session. Today's session was about wiping over the sock, the khuf, and the permissibility of doing that. We discussed the various opinions, the turbans, the plasters, the bandages, the, the hijab for our sisters, and the way of doing it. Anyone has any questions now at the end of the session? Online, any questions from brothers or sisters? Any comments? Give you a half a minute if there's any questions online. And as I said, if you've missed these sessions, or you, some of you missed these sessions, you came a little later, uh, or you've missed the previous sessions, all of them are available on our YouTube channel online. So where you can go over the previous sessions uh, as well, inshallah. Next week, we will continue with our uh, evolution of fiqh and we are now moving to the second stage of that uh, evolution and that was the time of the Khulafa Rashidun, the time of the early caliphs and how fiqh developed in their time. Yes, Salaamu Alaikum. Can you wipe over the Kufi? So the question is, can you wipe over the Kufi? Yes, you can. That's one opinion. Other scholars, they say the head should completely be covered like the turban. In the Prophet's time, they used to cover their entire head with a turban. And so if it is something similar to the turban, you know, your kufi is big enough, it goes all the way back and forth and covers the head, then yes, you can wipe over it. If it does not cover it, some scholars say you should not do it. Um, the safer one is that you, you wipe over it. If it's easier for you to remove your kufi and quickly wipe over it, then that's the safer option. Allahu yeah. Alam. Good question, mashallah. Yes, please. Sometimes uh, in different areas, people get very intense uh, about the opinion. And the very opinion is my part of the world, your part of the world. Yeah. So there's a very uh, important concept in our deen uh, mentioned in the Quran multiple times. That is, there are major sins and there are minor shortcomings. What Allah would like us to do is <coughs> away from the major sins and the minor shortcomings Allah let go of themselves. Amen. 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 Amen.
Yeah, and uh, I think the, the important point what the brother is saying here for those of you online is that sometimes we get really worked up about these differences. We become emotional, we, want, we become very pushy, uh, we want, want to put each other's opinions down and try to prove we are right and our madhab is right and our school of thought is right and you are wrong. We need to be very careful, especially with these secondary issues. There is no reason for us to fight and divide ourselves for these secondary issues. Alhamdulillah, we are united in the primary issues. We have the same Quran, the same Sunnah, the same Qibla, the same Prophet, the same you know God. So there is no reason for us to uh, make these issues a reason for division and getting angry at each other. We should learn from these different ulama and opinions. We should think critically about them. And then at the end of the day, we have to choose, obviously, uh, to go with this opinion or that opinion based on whichever seems to be correct and the scholars that we are following. Because, you know, for the layman, it can become very hard to decide, you know, which opinion is stronger and which one is not. We're not ulama. We're not scholars of the religion, right? We are students more uh, learning, trying to learn. So at the end of the day, you might put your trust in a scholar. You say, this scholar I know and I put my trust in this scholar. He's a good scholar. Uh, and I will follow their opinions. That's fine. That's absolutely fine. As long as you understand that this person is still a human being, that, you know, he's trying his best to find the truth. He will make mistakes. May Allah forgive this person. And there could be others who might be right in some areas and they could be wrong in other areas. We have to live with each other and we have to educate each other. So as long as the niya is to educate, to learn from each other, to stay together, then, you know, these we can have these discussions. But the moment the discussion turns into you know, sectarianism, my scholar versus your scholar, I am right and you're wrong. That's where we're going in the wrong direction regarding these secondary issues. With the primary issues, obviously, we have to be very, you know, uh, firm about the primary uh, uh, parts of the deen. But these secondary issues, uh, like the brother said, uh, we need to have more space in our heart and uh, welcome diversity of opinions. And Allahu Alam. That's why you should do lecture on Bidah, because some people are now everything is Bidah. Yeah, so brother's uh, comment here is that we should uh, learn more about bid'a or innovations in religion because he's saying that a lot of times we, you know, we have scholars, some people, some imams, some lecturers, they will say everything is a bid'a. Uh, even if it's a minor issue, and then there are those who are on the other other uh, uh, side of the spectrum. You are right, we need to be educated about these issues. But as long as we do our research and we are well informed about issues, uh, you will find that you'll find some perspective. What happens, I tell people this, and I've gone through this myself, I'm still going through this because I'm a student of knowledge, I'm not a scholar by any means. Um, one of the things I tell people is when you start learning the religion, in the beginning everything is black and white. Everything is clear in your head. You're like, this is right and this is wrong. And you are very opinionated in the beginning. But then the more you learn the religion, you start humbling yourself. Like, I thought it, this was very, very clear. And now I find out this, there is this other aspect of the religion which I never learned about. Because maybe you're basing your opinion on one hadith. You don't know the thousand other hadith on that subject. You're basing your opinion on one scholar. And there's, you know, a hundred other scholars who have discussed that. So the more you learn the more perspective you start getting about where you need to be. So give yourself time. That's my advice to everyone. Don't jump to quick conclusions in the beginning of your study. Give yourself a lot of time. Explore the different opinions. Look at their evidences. And then once you go through this process over and over and over again, you will start getting uh, some kind of a compass. You'll know, okay, this scholar is going in the wrong direction here. Or this guy is going in the right direction. I need to keep searching or digging in this area. Um, at the end of the day, as, as we said, we need to be open-minded and welcoming of different opinions. So how do we balance this, this crisis of reality in Western society like this, whereby everybody has a team and people come back to their team when they post this in the media of it is regarded by that 
a Muslim scholar, but you see someone is a Muslim scholar, it's a position, it's a profession, mm -hmm. and that they are experts on those issues. Mm -hmm. The same way we cannot have the medical doctors when we are not medical doctors, mm -hmm. the same way we cannot have the lawyers when we are not yes. lawyers. Yes. But when it comes to issues of <laughs> everybody is a Muslim scholar. Yes. yes. So how do we now set this flexibility in terms of differences of opinion or issue by scholar? How do we marry it with this disease? Yeah. Everybody compacting themselves into a Muslim scholar yeah. when it comes to yeah. religious matter. How do we yeah. address this crisis? I mean, that's a, that's a very good question and a difficult question to answer because it has so many facets. So the brother's question is how do we, we you know, stay within perspective in times where everyone acts like a religious scholar, everyone is opinionated. He's saying that when you're seeking medical advice, you go to the doctor. You don't, you know, try to challenge doctors because you are not a doctor. Uh, similarly, when you're seeking a lawyer, there is expert people who have studied this this area, and you know, so we go by their opinion. Uh, we don't act like lawyers ourselves, right? But he's saying when it comes to the religion, everyone thinks that they know, and everyone thinks that you know their opinion is the right opinion. Uh, this is very true, brother, and this is a crisis that we we are um, going through. My advice to you, and once again, we can only work on ourselves we cannot change other people right you can there's only so much you can change uh, yeah yeah but you can you, you have to work on yourself primarily right you can change yourself so uh, my advice to you would be as I said give yourself time stay humble don't get opinionated very easily very quickly unless you have done extensive research on a topic uh, if you are going by a scholar because you trust them and you like them and you know that they are good scholars, then you stick by them without patronizing them, without uh, thinking they are the only right scholar out there and all other scholars are wrong. Humbleness, I think, is a key. If you're not humble, then you will continuously run into those issues. But if you stay humble, like Imam Shafi, he has a quote. Whenever I think about that quote, it just moves me. He said, whenever I meet somebody younger than me, I tell myself he's better than me. And whenever I meet somebody older than me, I tell myself he's better than me. So somebody asked him, how is that possible? <laughs> you meet younger than you, he's better than you. You know, older than you, he's better than you. How, how do you do that? He said, because when I meet somebody younger than me, I tell myself, this person has less sins. Less life, so he has done less errors than me. I have more age than this person, so I need to humble myself. This person is better than me. And whenever I meet somebody older than me, I tell myself they have longer life, they have more good deeds, more Ramadans, more Salah, you know, more Quran than me. So I humble myself. So humbleness is the key to true knowledge. And actually that's a sign of knowledge. A knowledgeable person, a truly knowledgeable person, you'll always find humbleness in their character, in the way they, they speak, in the way they give their da'wah. But people who you know, think that they are scholars and you know, they are pushy and they think that you know, their opinion is the only opinion out there, they've actually um, been deluded by shaitan into arrogance. This is called scholarly arrogance, right? Where you feel, I already figured everything out. I know everything about it. That's what I'm saying. But uh, I have a question. Is collaboration between the imams, does that exist? Like, did they collaborate on certain things? Have they been, have they discussed certain hadith? If so, are you, give us an example. Are you talking about the major, the four major yeah, imams, yeah, let's say? Yeah. Yes, absolutely. So the brother's question is about the four major schools of thought and their imams. Did they collaborate? Did they meet each other? Did they have discussions? Absolutely. And in fact, the reality is that they are students of each other. I mean, Imam Abu Hanifa is the first one in the line, the dating. If you go from the dating perspective, he's the first one. Him and Imam Malik used to have uh, uh, frequent meetings because he used to come for hajj. Imam Abu Hanifa and Imam Malik is in Medina. So they used to have, have sessions together and they used to have the highest respect for each other. They would disagree with each other on many matters, but the highest respect for each other. Uh, Imam Malik, it is reported, uh, sorry, Imam Abu Hanifa, it is reported, um, or was it Imam? I think it's Imam Malik, uh, who went time, one time he went into an area where there was a hum, um, Hanafi masjid. No, Hanafi, uh, Imam and Hanafi masjid. And in the Maliki madhab, they pray with their hands on the side, right? So Imam Malik, he believes that your hands should be on the side in the prayer. In the Hanafi, you, you know, put it on your chest or, or actually uh, close to the chest. So anyway, he goes into the masjid and he, he folds his hands. So somebody recognized him, said, this is Imam Malik. 
They said, how come, O Imam Malik, your hands were folded when you believe that the hands should be on the side? He said, because I am being followed, I'm following a Hanafi Imam and I don't want to create any fitna here. You know, so you see, he's going against what he thinks is right in order to keep the unity, in order to keep the... Today, it's the other way around. Today, you'll find people who have a fiqh opinion and the entire masjid is doing one thing, they want to do their own thing. <laughs> they want to go against. But subhanallah. We have example from the Sahaba. Uthman ibn Affan, the third Khalifa, when he was leading Hajj, because he's the Imam going for Hajj, he goes there... And, you know, when they, they reach Mecca, the Prophet, peace be upon him, it was his practice to join, combine the prayers and shorten the prayer because they are traveling, right? So two rakah for Dhuhr, two for Asr. Uthman ibn Affan, he prays full four rakah for Dhuhr. So the Sahaba, the other companions go to him and say, what are you doing here? The Prophet, he shortened the prayer. Abu Bakr, he shortened the prayer. Uh, Umar, he shortened the prayer. And now you become the Khalifa and you're praying four rakahs full? You're going against the Prophet's way. Uthman ibn Affan, he said, in their times, the ummah was small. Few people used to come for hajj. Now, you have this big ummah coming for hajj, and many of these people are coming from lands very far away. And they have very little knowledge of Islam. I don't want them to go back to their home countries and say, Zohar prayer is two rakah. So, in order to keep them, you know, He's not saying that, you know, we should not pray. He's saying, yes, we should pray too, because the Prophet prayed too, uh, Abu Bakr prayed too, Umar prayed too, but I have a reasoning. I don't want them to be misguided. Don't we use the same reason today? Oh, but in Makkah, they, they do it like that, right? How many times have we heard that reasoning? Oh, in, in uh, Saudi Arabia, they do it like that, right? We always use that as a reference point. In Makkah, Medina, they do things like that. So Uthman ibn Affan is saying, I don't want them to go back home thinking the whole prayer is two rakah. The Sahaba still disagreed with him. They said, no, you have a reasoning, but you're still doing it wrong. We should still pray two rakah. But you know, when it was time for Salah, and he was leading them, they all prayed four rakah. They disagree with him. They think he should pray two rakah. But because he's the leader, because they want to be united, I have a difference of opinion on a secondary. This is not a primary issue. This is a secondary issue. So I am going to obey him. I'm going to be together with you. This is the attitude which is missing now. Everyone is so like, oh, you know, I am right and it has to be done this way, otherwise, you know. So this is the thing we need to, to work on. It depends, brother. When we say Sunni and Shia, sometimes we are, um, we are making broad statements. Okay? I know some Sunni brothers who call themselves Sunni, and they don't follow the Sunnah. And then I know some people who call themselves Shia and they are closer to the Sunnah than many of the Sunni brothers. So it's, I don't believe in these generalized statements. You talk about the individual. And people come to me, for example, to get my advice and they say, I'm getting married to this person. And this person says he's a Shia or he's a Sunni or whatever, he's a Sufi or he's this Ahl Sunnah or, you know, different, different people. And what is your opinion? I say, I have no opinion. Let this brother come to me. Let me talk to him. See what he's all about. Every individual is an entity in his own self. I grew up in Pakistan with Sunni, with Shia, with Sufi, with you know, all kinds of people there. And it was not about, you know, my friends were not based on these labels. It was about the person, what their aqidah is individually, what they believe in, what they do, what was their life, you know, all about. So it individuals. I say don't be specific, don't make general statements, but uh, try to find out about the individual himself. Yes, but, but I, I lived here long enough and I, I interact with people, Shia and so on, so, but I didn't even address it like a person himself in me. Mm -hmm. They believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Mm -hmm. They call it Sunnah of Sayyidina Muhammad mm -hmm. They call it the Quran. Mm -hmm. So who am I to say to them you're different? Mm -hmm. And they make a lot. So I come and said, oh, you Shia, you Sunni, this and that. That's why I'm saying that these labels are not required. We don't need these labels. No, no. We need to find out if the person is following the Quran and the Sunnah, their, their aqidah is good, then that's fine. Yes. Yeah, that's it. I don't want to get into these. I mean, I don't want to be called. People ask me, are you Sunni or Shia? I say, I'm a Muslim. I'm a Muslim. I don't want to get into these labels because these labels are not going to you know, uh, unite us. They're only going to divide us and make things complicated for us. 
So anyway, that's my opinion. Other people have different opinion on these issues. All right, so let's stop here. Uh, Jazakumullah khair. Inshallah, we'll continue with more next time. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdik. Ashadu an la ilaha illa ant. Nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilayk. Wa sallallahu ala muhammadin wa ala alihi wa ashabihi ajma'in. Birahmatika ya arhamar rahmin. We have Maghrib time, Brother Ahmed. Uh, we need to wrap up now. Jazakumullah khair. Barakallahu.